Cool. Mercedes, you have your name badge on. Oh, I'm on my own either. Right. I'm in the car. Okay, setting up the meeting for YouTube Live, done, redirecting. Here we are. There's everybody. Okay, I need to post the link quickly on Facebook. Oh, you do have yours on. I don't have mine on. Um, okay, I'm going to post this link and then we'll get running. There's everybody. Okay, I need to post the link quickly on Facebook. <laughs> Somebody needs to mute. Oh, you do have yours on. I don't have mine on. Um, okay, I'm going to post this link and then we'll get running. Okay, the link is posted. So, hi, everybody. We are officially live on YouTube. I think I need to mute my computer. Haha, <laughs> that's better. Okay, so that's my fault. Okay, so uh, we are officially live. Welcome to the July meeting um, for the Pikes Peak Mycological Society. Um, we have a very special speaker that Mercedes will introduce uh, momentarily, um, joining us all the way from California. So thank you everybody for coming. Uh, sorry for the slight delay in technical issues. Um, uh, just a quick announcement before we get going. For paid members of Pikes Peak Ecological Society, we are having a club foray on Saturday. Details will be emailed to you. And we'll have another foray on August 1st. That details will also be sent to you. If you want to go on a foray, but you're not a paid member, you can join up very easily on pikespeakmike.org slash join. It's $30 for an individual for one year. Kids under 18 are always free. So um, with that said, I will let Mercedes take the floor. Cool. Hey, everyone. I'm Mercedes Perez Whitman. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I am the co-editor of the Pikes Peak Mycological Society's newsletter, and I'm helping introduce our very special guest, Mario, while our president, Ben Kingsley, and newsletter editor, Jessica Langley, are out of town. Um, Speaking of the newsletter, we will have another one coming out next month, and we're looking for submissions. You can send me yours at editor at pikespeakmike.org. Um, I also want to start off by acknowledging that we're on stolen land. Colorado Springs is located in the unceded territory of the Ute peoples. Um, this land, including the larger Pikes Peak region, has also been home to um, nations like the Arapaho, Apache, Cheyenne, and Comanche peoples. And to get going on this intro, Mario Ceballos is an organizer for the People of Color Fungi Community, uh, or POCFC, which is a grassroots community of queer, transgender, Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Uh, folks who see themselves at the intersection of ecological and social issues, as well as having an interest in mycology. The POCFC was created to address issues of access to, medic to medicinal and edible fungi, representation in mycology, and maybe most importantly, to reclaim indigenous knowledge and mitigate appropriation of sacred medicine. The POCFC just celebrated their one year anniversary with the fungi gathering on Kumeye territory, AKA San Diego. And it was a huge success, a testament to the need for this community. The event reflected the values and intersectional approach to all things fungi, which also included a community building component. And since the creation of POCFC, it's grown into a community resource and has responded to the needs of community with mutual aids efforts, uh, which have become the primary focus of their work since the beginning of the pandemic. For the PPMS meeting, Mario will present indigenous fungi use on Turtle Island. In this discussion style knowledge share, we will turn to the stories and wisdom that were left for us to learn from and by the people who have had the longest connection to this land. Part PowerPoint and part storytelling, bring a notepad and cozy up for a night of indigenous <laughs> mushroom stories. Thank you so much for being here, Mario, and feel free to just take it away. Uh, thank you, Mercedes. Thank you, Alyssa. 
and uh, Pikes Peak Mycological Society. I appreciate it. Um, thanks for the invite. So yeah, my name is Mario Ceballos. I use he, him, they pronouns. I am the son of Mario Ceballos and Veronica Miranda and the grandson of Elsa Miranda and Juanis Ceballos and the great, great grandson of Antonia Pema. Antonia Miranda and, and Pema Ceballos. Um, and it's an honor to be here on Kumi territory where I'm, where I'm you know, currently broadcasting from. Um, you know, we're dealing with, a, there's a lot going on here. Um, there's always going a lot, a lot going on here when there's a, a border up, you know, dividing Kumi territory. <clears throat> so um, yeah, currently the Kumi folks are dealing with uh, desecration of their lands, of their sacred lands. And um, if you want to find out more, you're welcome to look up uh, Kumi Defense Against the Wall. Um, their page. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to, you know, just quickly acknowledge where I'm coming from. Um, and, uh, you know, thank you for educating me uh, on where you're, the territory you're, you're on. I was trying to do some research as well. And, um, you know, I think I'll mention a little bit that in, in the presentation. Um, I guess I quickly did want to just kind of apologize in advance and ask for forgiveness. Um, just uh, just because of the topics that we're dealing with and talking about can be can be heavy. Uh, they can be triggering at times. Um, and uh, yeah, just some sensitive uh, topics, you know, when dealing with um, you know, the story of indigenous people, um, you know, it, it often brings up, um, you know, the story uh, of colonization and, you know, all the tragedies and, and, and the trauma that, that came associated with that. So, um, you know, in case there's, um, you know, any offense committed, um, if I'm mispronounced or, or, or misspeak, um, you know, I just, I, I want to make clear that I'm learning myself. I am, I, you know, I'm, I'm self-taught and, and um, you know, I am just uh, I'm lucky to be, uh, you know, on this path of learning. <clears throat> so, so in that way, I just ask for, for leniency and, and, and like I said, forgiveness. Um, but I am honored um, and like I said, and grateful, you know, to be upheld by my community who has supported me in this, in this path and, and has helped me uh, and, uh, just kind of, uh, you know, come out with a lot of this knowledge and, and um, you know, and, and out of that, a community was born and this community has really has been uh, just holding up this work. And so there's so many people to think, a lot of elders to think, uh, a lot of youth and children to think as well for, you know, just their continued support and inspirational, inspiration and, 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 and their uh, dedication uh, and willingness to always educate us and hold us accountable when necessary even, you know, so, uh, so I just want to thank you on that, uh, you know, on my behalf, there's really so many people to thank, and I won't, I won't do that now, but, um, but you know who you are. Uh, also, um, kind of wanted to apologize. I do have a little five-month-old dog running around, and he might bark every once in a while or need me, uh, ask to be let out, so. I have the door right behind me and I'll let him out if need be. But other than that, um, there shouldn't be any interruptions because my partner took my three little ones to go get pizza and uh, I got the house to myself uh, other than Cosmo, my little five month old beagle. So, um, so yeah, with that, I kind of wanted to start off my presentation and YouTube. There's a lot to cover and I'm going to try to go as quick as I can because I want to spend some time a little later um, on some of the stories. Um, uh, so yeah, let's kind of get into it. I'm going to do the screen share. Post. Can we, um, can I do screen sharing? Can you help me with that? I guess that's not allowed. Yes, what's, what's it telling you? Host disabled participant screen sharing. Maybe try now. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, you're fine. Um, where am I at? We're not sharing your screen. You're seeing your screen yet. Did you click share? Let me see. Um, 
me see, it should be. There, there we, we go. go. Good job. Okay, right on. And there we go. Boom. <clears throat> I'm going to take a deep breath real quick. And if you all want to join me, uh, that'd be amazing too. Um, I am burning a little sage and, and chaga here, kind of honoring the nation and the people whose lands I'm on and, and some of the people whose lands I'll be talking about today. Um, people in the First Nations territories, um, you know, Canada, so-called Canada. Uh, do use Chaga and and uh, the Nashinabig and um, who are the folks I'll be I'll be speaking about today later in the presentation. Also know Chaga really well, so um, yeah, I'm bringing a little uh, sage and uh, Chaga, and I'm sipping on some reishi and Chaga tea today. <clears throat> I just kind of wanted to take a deep breath, and if y'all want to join me. I know we're on these little boxes and these screens, but usually when we do story time, we do it in a circle. And um, you know, there's no real hierarchy uh, when you're in a circle. So, and it's just, you know, a lot better that way, you know? But um, I'm gonna take a deep breath. Again, just ask the ancestors to be with me. And we'll and um, help me along, support me through these stories and through what I'm about to share. <clears throat> so indigenous fungi uses on Turtle Island for Pikes Peak. Um, I wanted to share this a little bit of art as well that my friend Gloria um, helped create for us for our uh, fungi gathering that we had and which included a lot of, lot of art as well. And um, this was, one of the little pieces that we had and it was printed on some buttons and some shirts and um, yeah just I don't know there's a lot going on including some spores falling from the from the Amanita muscaria and um, yeah I think that's kind of how we see ourselves as well just you know dispersing this knowledge um, and sharing our intersectional approach to uh, to mycology, if you will, to science. Um, this is another piece that was done by uh, my sister. Actually, um, we're just trying to, you know, encapsulate everything we're about, and it's really just um, and there's really more that goes to this, and this might even need to be updated soon. Um, but um, you know, there's a, we're taking this multi-dimensional, multi, uh, uh, you know, intersectional, you know, uh, approach to mycology and looking at politics, looking at healing, looking at access. And, um, you know, especially, and we started noticing uh, a few years ago, um, you know, a lot of commodification of, of medicines and of indigenous knowledge and and not not a lot of uh, reciprocity, you know, and acknowledging where that knowledge came from, and just a lot of people um, kind of getting rich off of, uh, like I said, indigenous knowledge and, and medicine. And um, so we wanted to kind of address these all these things, um, and we knew there was going to be um, just a lot of work ahead of us. So. You know, we've been chipping away at it little by little, um, you know, and, you know, just kind of adjusting with the times and, and with the needs of our community. And, and in that way, we've been learning a lot of what our community needs are and, and what um, and how to approach, approach these topics and, you know, what we want to learn and offer, um, you know, to our communities and, and communities at large in our broader community, which has grown uh, nationwide. Pretty much, there's a lot of support, and and, and there's different uh, folks talking about creating their own versions of a POC fungi community. Uh, you know, uh, different names. Um, there's even in Oakland decolonized mycology that just um, you know uh, was born this year as well. And um, you know, there are a lot of great folks around the country doing a lot of great work um, that are similar to what we're doing. And, and we are just like, you know, uh, 
you know, like our teachers before us are just standing on the shoulders of giants, you know, um, a lot of the stuff that we talk about and, and present has been talked about already. Um, um, a lot of it just hasn't been spoken about in these circles. And I think that's what sometimes just, um, you know, is the difference uh, and why we might have some visibility right now. So, you know, I acknowledge that privilege, you know, in, that, in our visibility. Um, and we're trying to use that privilege to, you know, to bring light to uh, some of these issues, especially appropriation of, of indigenous cultures. <clears throat> So that's a quick little intro to what POC fungi is. Um, I'm going to jump into indigenous use of fungi, uh, indigenous uses of fungi. And one of the things that um, you know, I wanted to talk about and acknowledge uh, today is Maria Sabina's birthday. And you know, when we talk about indigenous use, um, you know, a lot of times it is fetishized and, and it focuses on divinatory use of, of fungi. And you know it's often looked upon like in an anthropolo anthropological lens, and or worse, I write here, you know, um, meaning worse meaning for exploitation, um, like I said, or commodification uh, of indigenous ways, knowledge. Um, you know, this is you know, and I say fetishized because um, you know in this you know in this Western culture, there's definitely a need to you know there's you know often a void to fail spiritually. And um, well, indigenous cultures can often offer to fill that, you know. And um, but what happens is, like I said, it's often uh, done in a disrespectful way, and it ends up um, doing a lot more harm, um, you know, when uh, than good, you know. Especially when you think about what the story of Maria Sabina, you know, this is Gordon Watson here, you know, he was a he was a known uh, uh, you know, Morgan, uh, Chase Morgan, um, uh, investor and, and banker and, and uh, you know, and even darker side has said that he was even involved in CIA and, and, and even darker stuff still, you know, but, um, you know, he, he was the one who was responsible for, you know, printing the Time magazine and, and basically, you know, um, letting the cat out of the bag and what happened subsequently, um, you know, was, you know, there was a cultural shift uh, and, and a consciousness shift and there was a, a you know, a whole, you know, whole uh, string of events that happened after that. But, you know, she died a poor woman um, that was even ostracized from her community um, for, you know, for the harm and, and and for you know, for what a lot of times in indigenous communities felt was you know letting you know letting their secrets uh, out you know especially, um, and and the way they were used, um, you know and and you know people came into the town and basically you know started the hippie invasion uh, down in Oaxaca you know so, um, you know. I think, and there's a lot to say to that, and I, I don't, I won't spend too much time there because I can. That's a really a subject that's kind of near and dear to my heart, and um, you know, I do consider Maria Sabina uh, a teacher of mine, and I, I thank her for being the generous person that she was, who, and and uh, and you know, somebody came looking, wanting to learn, and she didn't see color, but um, unfortunately, um, she did, you know, uh, you know fall victim to a lot of the practices that colonization um, often imposes, you know. Um, and here to the right, you know, we have a Siberian shaman holding the Amity in Muscaria. And I also wanted to acknowledge that culture um, and the Siberian culture and, and all the contributions that they've made to our, you know, uh, culture and stories of, of, of Christmas and, and, and all, you know, all the folklore there. Of reindeers and um you know that's where the, this is the shaman the word shaman this is where the word comes from from the from the siberian tribes and and particularly uh i believe it's the kanti people uh and even the word chaga is uh um is a is a kanti word which is you know a, a tribe in, in siberia Okay, I knew I needed to show some mushrooms before my mushroom people freaked out. So um, this is a pretty cool mushroom that I have never met myself. Um, 
Uh, I look forward to the day I get to meet this relative. Um, it's Philenius Ignarius, aka Ikmik. It's, um, yeah, it's, you know, I'll explain a little bit more about it later, but I've been reading through some of the, some of the books that I've, you know, that I've come across recently. Um, when speaking about indigenous knowledge and, and fungi use, uh, this is one that's mentioned as, as a very sacred mushroom, actually. And I'll show how, you know, like many other sacred mushrooms, this mushroom, although not um, hallucin, you know, does not ha have hallucinatory uh, effects, um, you know, has also been uh, taken out of sacred context and, and is even abused now. Um, so, you know, I just wanted also, I need to mention where I'm from, the California tribes, like the Mono, the Miwok, the Chumash, the Ojaloni, uh, the Pomo, uh, Shasta, the Yurok, the Paiute are just a few of the California tribes that are, that are really just um, recorded, have recorded use of mushrooms as food and medicine. Um, where I'm at, it's that, you know, we're known, I'm in the Southwest, um, you know, and it's desert, coastal desert. And often people ask me like, you know, it's funny that you're so into mushrooms when you live in the coastal desert region. And it's, it's kind of true and I get it. Then I will admit um, cactus and, and desert plants are my, you know, one of my first loves for sure, succulents. Um, um, but um, yeah, we do have, we do have a lot of fungal diversity here. And I would argue that um, a lot of the fungal diversity has been um, kind of depleted due to a lot of, um, you know, early on, there was a lot of, in the Victorian era, there was a lot of, uh, you know, like, botany and, and arborist clubs. And there's even a lot of famous people and parts named after people here um, uh, for these people who, who really changed the landscape when, you know, and creating these large gardens and, and bringing in, there was like a big push to bring in um, uh, eucalyptus trees from Australia and trees from all around the country and pines, including pines, but especially eucalyptus. Um, and we, we eucalyptus does it basically does deplete and it does it will destroy any fungal diversity <clears throat> that you know, kind of existed there. So, you know, this land was home. Um, it's home to the California oak tree and and uh, the grizzly bear. And you know, the grizzly bears are state flag, but there's no grizzly bears in our state, and they'll probably never roam in our state again. Um, so, you know, and the oak tree you know, was basically cultivated not just for their acorns, but also because there's a lot of oak loving fungi um, that live and enjoy, you know, that are, are, that are edible, um, that, you know, are uh, under these oak trees. And so I have no doubt that the Kumi people um, also enjoyed and knew, uh, fun, you know, mushrooms and fungi really well. Um, some of the papers I've looked up, um, they mentioned that Kumie folks do have a fungi use, um, but they don't have specific names to what it is. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of on a, um, you know, on a, I guess you could say, you know, a bit of a mission, you know, just to kind of recover, you know, this knowledge and, and find out and figure out if, um, you know, if, if there, you know, if there's anybody out there who, who has any knowledge of, you know, a fungi use and, you know, maybe if somebody who remembers their grandma using this mushroom for something, but they haven't done it and they just kind of forgot about these ways, um, which often happens, um, you know, out of need to assimilate, out of the need to um, sometimes uh, out of shame, you know, um, out of shame of your indigenous heritage because it's often uh, looked down upon. And, you know, again, I'll talk about that. And it's even mentioned in this book um, that I'll be talking about later. So yeah, and when I was doing my homework, um, the Hikaria, Apache, and the Cheyenne are the people of so-called Pikes Peak, Colorado. But it was uh, good to uh, get, you know, more clarification on that. Um, so thanks, Mercedes. And you know, this is I found this out kind of looking on um, uh, uh, it's on indigenousland.com. I wasn't even show it here, but we'll just save that for later at the end, maybe. And um, so I did want to, you know, mention the Anishinaabe and the First Nations people all have close relationships with many conch mushrooms that are used as fire starters, medicine, smoke purification, protection, and tobacco mixtures, like this uh, ikmik, 
you know, the mushroom in the background. Um, and the Anashinaabeg uh, are the, you know, the people I'll kind of be focusing on today. Um, and, you know, that's kind of where the stories will be coming from. So I just wanted to make sure, you know, you know all these people, uh, peoples around uh, are mentioned and, and acknowledged um, when speaking about mushrooms. Um, when you do anything in, in research to ethnomycology in regard to indigenous tribes uh, or Native American tribes or First Nations tribes, um, there's very little knowledge, very little research done, and often even explained as as not not really existent. Um, you know, portraying indigenous folks as maybe fungi fearing people, which you'll see is not true and not the case. And as I've learned uh, throughout the years is like actually complete opposite. Um, I believe that that was actually an imposed thought um, brought upon by, you know, Christianity and colonization and, you know, basically things like the Spanish Inquisition. Um, so <clears throat> I wanted to make, mention some sustainability um, issues around fungi, right, and commodification. So this is, um, you know, uh, you know, some people going out into into the boreal forest, I believe, uh, near Alaska, and um, um, harvesting all this igmic, you know, all this felenius ignarius. Uh, I love that name, by the way. It's, I say that all day. It's fun to say, um, but igmic, uh, equally as fun to say, is the uh, um, is the Inuit word for it um, is basically being taken out of the forest in these mass quantities of ways, and then it gets fired. And once it gets fired, it gets powdered, turned in, you know, it's this ash. And <clears throat> what this does, it, you know, you, they add it to a tobacco mixture. And one of the stories in this book that I, that I, that I've you know, written by Kiwai Dinokwai, and you know, I'll mention more her, about her later. Um, you know, they mention this mushroom and creating tobacco mixtures for, in as a special tobacco uh, mixture reserved for special occasions, and especially um, to seal seal a bond, seal a treaty, uh, seal an agreement. Um, it's, you know, this special mixture of tobacco is reserved. And what it is, is because, because the mushroom is, um, it's, 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 a, you know, it's very easily combustible. You know, you don't want to start, you don't want to, you know, try to light your tobacco and it not light, because that would be looked upon as a sign of, you know, a, kind of a bad omen, like maybe it's not a good agreement. So you want to, you know, you reserve and make sure that tobacco lights. So to do that, you you mix some of this ash. This it's called they call it punk ash. Um, um, you mix it with the tobacco, and it's sure to light up. You know, and that way there's no, you know, embarrassment, and then just kind of seals the deal, and everybody feels good about it, right? That was it lit up, you know, on the first light, first hit. And you get to pass this, pass this around, and everybody gets to share it without having to relight it over and over again, and and it makes for good times. What also does actually uh, activate some of the GABA receptors, and uh, it basically does um, uh, help with the uptake of nicotine. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, it does, you know, it gives a smoother, better, you know, uh, more potent, uh, you know, um, you know, high, if you will. But, you know, in indigenous cultures, that's, you know, that's not seen upon as, you know, as getting high. And, and especially in those occasions, it was definitely looked upon as, you know, just a good, you know, good medicine. This is good medicine and, this is, and it was obviously reserved for special occasions, right? But uh, today, you know, and indigenous people would never go out and, and harvest this much um, uh once and fire this much, it would, you know, maybe you get one or two pieces of it and, and that should last you pretty much uh, a year or two or more, you know, it's not something you, and you gift it, it's not something you, you take advantage of or, or um, you abuse, but, um, you know, some, 
some companies, um, you know, have commodified it. And this is one of the companies and, you know, it's really uh, super problematic. You know, they call it, chew it's chewing tobacco plus Alaskan punk ash equals Eskimo cocaine. And if you need me to tell you why that's problematic, um, you know, you need to do some homework. Um, if you want to let them know how you feel about it and you can let them know that I sent you to, um, yeah, punkash.com. There's their number. Um, yeah, super problematic and and really um, just to me reminds me, you know, commodification of sacred medicine and medicines getting into the wrong hands and becoming, uh, you know, bad medicine and then in turn becoming a something that can hurt us, you know, um, because yeah, an Eskimo, excuse me, in in Inuit and Alaskan territories. Um, there is uh, a campaign, you know, to, to to help a lot of the young people um, get off of tobacco because it has become addictive, and you know they they chew it, and you know there's it's been uh, linked to uh, higher rates of cancer, of uh, the throat, of the tongue, of the you know the mouth, and you know people are losing their teeth, and and um, you know again it's just. Um, you know, just horrible to see see that, you know. So, you know, um, tobacco, again, another sacred medicine and indigenous medicine um, that has been taken and 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 commodified and and made bad for us, you know. So um, that's what I wanted to mention about that. It's just triggering in a lot of ways. Again, I wanted to apologize for the use of that word and for even just and showing that up here, which I know can be triggering, but um, that's that website is up right now, and um, yeah, you know, it just needed to be mentioned. Um, so this is, you know, if you've ever heard me do any talks, I always, I often talk about this paper, uh, California Indian Ethnomycology and Associated Forest Management by M. K. Anderson. It was printed in twenty in uh, in twenty thirteen. Um, it was it's really one of the only journals done um, on. In, like really an extensive research done um, on indigenous fungi use, you know, for medicine and, and, and food. Um, and that doesn't really, like I said, focus on divinatory or hallucinogenic properties, um, really just looking at, you know, um, the uses of fungi. And this person, uh, M. Cat Anderson is actually also the author of Tending the Wild, um, you know, and, and that explains on how, you know, uh, the California tribes would tend the wild, tend the forest by uh, controlled fires, controlled burns, right? Uh, cultural burning, they call it. And, um, um, you know, when the Spanish came here, they were, you know, they were always wondering why, why they were doing that, why indigenous and, the, you know, tribes were always doing these things like burning up the forest. But little did they know that they were, it was actually helping, it's helping the forest it actually activates, um, you know, oaks to grow and, and, and acorn production. And, and if you know anything about morales, um, you know that mush, morale mushrooms like to come up after a fire. And um, so it's, it's not far fetched to say that um, California indigenous tribes cultivated mushrooms, um, wild scented mushrooms, um, both. Uh, you know, um, like I said, you know, intentionally un and unintentionally, I believe very intentionally, um, especially with Morel, Chantrells, uh, the Matusaki. Um, and um, I would say there's, I mean, there's really many more. Um, yeah, I wanted to show some, some, some of these pictures, especially because they're, they're current. And when we uh, speak about Indigenous tribes, we think about, we don't think about them in present tense, right? And we're thinking about them in past tense. And I often, and I've been, and I've been corrected before, and I've done that before, you know, by mistake, and I should know better. But um, this is Laverne Glaze uh, from the Karuk Yurok uh, tribes. Oops, sorry, let me go back. Skipping ahead, I'm trying to get this little thing out of the way. Um, but yeah, she's, um, I just, I love this picture of her. Um, this picture shouldn't be in black and white either. That's just how it is in the journal. 
Um, you know, again, you know, we see these pictures in black and white and we think this was years ago, but this was taken in 2012, 2013, you know, um, and yeah, she's holding the, you know, Matsusake, Matsutake mushroom, sorry. I'm always, I'm gonna mess up a lot of words here, especially for you, uh, my ecology people, you can feel free to jump in and correct me anytime. Um, and this is also Phyllis Montgomery, hey. Phyllis Montgomery, uh, Central Sierra Miwok, um, with a coral mushroom, the Ramaria. And um, yeah, if you look up in you know some books, they'll say Ramaria is not edible, but it's definitely edible. And 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 you, know, you can see her there appreciating it. And and um, you know this paper does talk about it. Some, it gives it's a really extensive journal. Um, it's kind of a dry read for some. Um, fun read for a lot of others like me but um uh yeah it talks about the way they use these as for food and it even gives a couple of quick little recipes and you could kind of imagine um you know you know the researcher being there with them de definitely not imposing their you know their views and just kind of letting their stories come come through their journals so i think if you read it with that context you, you might you appreciate it too um i did want to mention or, or show this here uh that was kind of a, you know, kind of amazing uh, if you know diamond willow fungus i know a lot of folks in you know uh northern northern plains uh territories uh do know this fungus um they use it you know to to create regalia you know it's hapoporous odorous I guess it has this really strong anise-like smell. So I guess that, you know, it was really used and is used, I should stop saying in, in past tense, is used um, in ceremony and purification and protection against illness. And even I've read that's even used like uh, in preparation for war. Um, you know, I could see why, especially for protection, you know. Um, Well, how are we doing on time? We have about 20 minutes um, to go. Okay, cool. cool. But we can do a Q&A if you want to. That's okay, awesome. well, yeah, we'll see. Um, I, yeah, let me keep going. <laughs> I'm going to see where I get to. I, I want to do a little bit of story time at the end, but I did want to get through this. I only have a couple more slides. Okay, so okay. this, yeah, so this is, um, I think everybody knows this. Um, this is the Amadou, this is the underside of it because it's so sexy on the underside as well. But the Anashinaabe, the name that they use and that, you know, what they call it is GB Epushkewa. And, you know, I think it's important, you know, that, you know, we're learning all these names, you know, Fomis Fomentarius, Amadou, Hoof Fungus. Um, I think it's important that we start in trying to include indigenous names as well, um, you know, and, you know, we try to, you know, a lot of people are into acknowledging the land, but I think a part of acknowledging is <clears throat> preserving and remembering, you know, the languages and uh, and if we could remember these names and try to integrate that in our learning, I think we'd be doing a great, uh, you know, great service to ourselves and, and, and the people whose land we stand on and stories we're learning about, right? Um, so um, yesterday, um, July 21st was Ki White uh the anniversary of her passing uh, in 1999. Ki White was, you know, I'll let you kind of read this and I, I guess I'm gonna, maybe I'll start now. I wanna read from the book actually. Um, it was kind of a forward done on her, um, which I thought was just really well put and, and worth reading directly from the book. This was kind of taken from uh, which you have on the screen there is kind of taken from um, from Wikipedia, which is also really well put, but um, that's why I threw it up there. Um, but Kiwai Dinagwai is a multi-talented woman. She is a teacher, a curer, a champion of women's issues, a role model, a scholar, and a botanist. Kiwai Dinagwai is an Anishinaabe Chippewa elder who once 
us to learn ethnobotany, not from a Western scientific perspective, but by appreciating the botany of a people, a deeper and more significant meaning of ethnobotany, truly the botany of the people. Ethnobotany, as practiced by Kiwa Dinokwai, is authoritative because she is an Anishinaabe who knows the language, the metaphorical importance of plants in the culture, and how people should treat them as a way to thank the creator for their presence on earth. Her work is inspired and makes most other so-called ethnobotanical studies of cultural groups pale by comparison. The occasion of her publication of Pupui for the People is a time for celebration. The reader will find Kiwai Dinokwai's approach inspiring. She weaves a lesson that includes tales about each species, drawings of them in cultural context, their appearance as perceived by the Nashinabe, and personal experiences with each. Her study reveals the importance of these unusual life forms in the culture of the Chippewa. Although most readers will think about fungi in terms of their edible qualities, she knows that food value is one usage, but not the most numerous or salient. There are fire starters, combs, and even perfume. There are medicine and religious sacraments. They are a source of intellectual contemplation for their special qualities, but not fear. For the traditional Anishinaabe, fungi were once integral to the survival of the culture, and this is presented in the ethnobotany. Never have fungi been presented in an ethnobotany of any people, as K.E.Y. Tina Kwe has done. <clears throat> As, as Kiwa Dino Kwai has done here. This little volume is a remarkable ethnobotanical achievement with no other studies for comparison. Her work is a monument to a lifetime of careful observation and listening to others a generation removed from her. Her description are lucid, her descriptions are lucid, reliable, and unprecedented, unprecedented. Kiwai Dino Kwai reminds us that fungi need to be perceived as part of an integrated plant world that grows on Mother Earth. Kiwai Dino Kwai is, a is the repository of cultural legacies that she wants to share with the youth of her culture and with others who together share a biological heritage. Kiwai Dino Kwai speaks with a special voice. It is both authoritative and humble. It is a voice of the ages that echoes her ancestors' teachings and says, this is not for me, but for you, all of you. Read Pupuhui for the people with pleasure. Learn from it, appreciate his messages, and by doing so, you will bestow upon Kiwa a great honor because her ethnobotany will bring meaning to your life as well. That was written by Richard I. Ford, the director of an ethnobotanical uh, laboratory in the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor which uh, is where she uh, did receive um, her education from. So yeah, um, it was that was really well put and I really just can't do any better than that. Um, you know, there's, I've been sharing from this book, um, you know, and I also really quick wanted to think, um, Rachel Zoller, Yellow Eleanor, uh, for uh, after actually gifted me this book. Um, it was a really special day when I came home and I found, you know, this book was, you know, I had a package waiting for me. And, and um, you know, this, this is a rare, hard to find book. If you look it up, you'll see how expensive it is and how hard it is to find. And um, like I said before, it's, you know anything on ethnomycology, indigenous fungi use is is scarce to or to none, right? And so this is really one of the only books on indigenous fungi use. So I do consider it an honor to have this, and I wanted to say thank you, Rachel. I, I really appreciate you. Um. So um, let me check time. I'm gonna do. I want to share. There's there's so many stories I want to share from here, and um. And I'm thinking of the best way to to honor her, um, honor her memory, honor our, our elders, like I said, like Maria Sabina as well. Um, there's some pretty triggering stories in here as well, but I think I'm gonna kind of read the, the preface in, in its entirety for y'all. Um, and I think for a couple of reasons, and you'll see why at the end. Um, so the word popoe is an old Algonquin term that we would do well to rejuvenate. It means to swell up in stature suddenly. 
and silently from an unseen source of power. It is particularly suitable when referring to fungi, but the verb is certainly not limited to that use. In English, there is no equivalent. The Anishinaabe can find a potential pupui in their ancient cultural heritage. For all peoples, there is a better health in that natural source of power, the full use of plants. I said Anishinaabe and must explain that name. We prefer not to be called Indians. Christopher Columbus was one who made that mistake, was the one who made that mistake. Many know this to be, to be so, but just the same, the mistaken name has continued for centuries. We are not of the same race as the Indians and the native peoples of the Americas are apparently not all of one race. Remember, this was written in 1971. I belong to the Algonquin group named by the French as the Ojibwe, usually translated into English as the Ojibwe. One group of the people, people of the tree of the three fires, the Potawatomi, the Chippewa, and the Odawa, who with local variations and annotations all speak the same language, Ojibwe or Anishinaabe, is frequently taken as meaning to roast until puckered up. Recently read in a book that's sponsored by the state of Michigan that suggests Ojibwe refers to the treatment of captives. Thank goodness most authors writing on the subject have related the word to moccasin. The name originally comes from Ojibwe, writing on birch bark. We are proud of this accomplishment because we alone among woodland folk had a system of conveying ideas by writing. Ojibwe is usually spelled today by scholars, Ojibwe. Assuming that a people has the right to be called by the name which they themselves have always used, Throughout this book, I use Anishinaabe, the people who come from the place beyond where the sun rises. In practice, Nishinawabe is spoken by, my, by many, but not considered culturally refined. The native peoples of America are known to have made use of a vast reservoir of herbal knowledge, actually believing that there is an harmony, that there is, sorry, that there is an herb to meet every possible need. People unequated with the harmony of the old tribal life have assumed these herbal uses to be largely superstitious. This is not so. Authorities who have written about us have more often than not remained silent on the subject of herbal knowledge or else denied the value of its existence. This is true of the fungi. In fact, many scholars have stoutly maintained that our people disliked and always feared the fungi their only use being reserved for departed spirits who munch on them in the gray afterlife. The contents of this book are limited to a few uses of fungi, but of, the, of course, the, benefic the beneficial uses of plants, including fungi, are not so limited. Most of the information contained herein was gained from four persons, my mother, Mino Sonikwe, Sarah Goodcook, literally, she is cooking well woman who was a superla superlative culinary artist. My father, Wabushtigwan, whose head is silver like the sun, whose personal yardstick of anyone or anything was the degree of his or its practical success. My paternal grandfather, Mije Ojima, he leads in the grand medicine who measured all things by their spiritual and sensual qualities and completely confounded all European minds by confounding the two and my herb mother, Noji Makwe, healing woman, whose accumulation of materia medica was truly astonishing. Noji Makwe was a member of the Crane clan, Dodemashitni, Ahishnikik, pardon me, as I am, the Crane clan is the repository of the traditions of our people. At an early age, I had determined to stand and be medicined at least three times in the old society before the impact of European materialism. Long preparations were required of each individual who would eventually assume a specific responsibility within the clan unit. I was accordingly apprenticed to Noji Mwake an herbalist of the village who know Mini for two years, although ultimately our association, our association con continued much longer. At the time, the old ways had already declined and Noji Mwakwe 
whose extensive resources and professional acumen were worthy of many apprentices had not received an apprentice in 15 years. She was delighted and honored by my apprenticeship. In truth, it was I who was honored. But in my youthful callowness, I did not realize it. Decades later, I continued to cherish with all my being the role of the healer as Noji Mwakwe explained, exemplified it. She would say a true mashi, mashkiki not only initiates primary healing, but continues to address the needs targeted by the healing until they disappear. The goal is a balanced life and a balanced body. Kid animikon, noji make. Kiwadinakwai, woman of the Northwest wind. And if we have time, I can show like a couple small little stories or recipes, but- uh, Yeah, we have a few minutes. Yeah, we could do that. Um, unless there's some like really pressing questions that people have, which I don't mind answering a couple questions. Um, yeah, if there, we can open up the floor for questions if, or I don't know if people can participate, but um, they can type in their questions to YouTube and we can field them from there. Yeah. yeah maybe, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, yeah, I was gonna say, I'm willing to take a couple questions um, if y'all wanna ask for one or two and. I'll pick out a little story here that might make sense. And then, you know, we can maybe end it with the story actually. So yeah, I'm willing to take a couple questions. Okay, I don't see anything posted right now, but I know it's a little sl uh, slower. So um, we can see if any roll in. Um, <clears throat> oops, what say? Also, are we going to the 7.30? Because if so, we, we still got a good chunk of time. We can go to 7 or 7.30. It's really up to, to Mario. Okay. Let's keep rolling. All Let's right. Rolling. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, I'll let you know if I see any, if I see any questions pop up. Um, people were asking about the name of the book, but I, I, I uh, sure. responded. Well, just, okay, well, go ahead. Yeah, I'm gonna, you guys can still see my screen. Yeah, right? Yes. Yeah. Cool, so I, this is real quick. I'm gonna just talk about Garden Island where um, um, where Kiwadina Kwai was born. It's basically, you see there in the middle of the Great Lakes. And, you know, from pictures that I've seen, it looks gorgeous and it's like really lush and, you know, pines and trees everywhere. <laughs> Sorry, can you hear my dog? Yes. Um, Cute. What kind of dog is it? A beagle. Oh, okay. <laughs> a little beagle mix. How cute. Yes, thank you. Um, so yeah, I did, you know, just wanted to mention a little bit about, you know, I'm learning myself, like I said, and, you know, just like in my own culture, um, you know, I identify as, as Chicanx, you know, and it comes with a lot of complicated identity um, layers. Um, I, I do have the privilege of knowing where I, my people come from, but unlike many of uh, people who identify like me, you know, don't often have that privilege because we've been separated from our, from our lands. Um, I come from the, the, the Yoame or the Yaqui people and the Wichateca or the Wichol people. And, um, you know, they, my, my great grandmother, you know, crossed the border back and forth before there was a border and before there was a line and, you know, didn't know the difference, you know, between, between the two. Um, cause you know, she grew up in the Sonoran desert and, um, you know, didn't realize there was a border she was even crossing. Um, you know, so, you know, again, you know, understanding that I'm, I'm learning that there's also complex stories like that being told all over the country, including here with the national big, um, you know, and I'm learning that some of these names aren't the names that they choose, upon, that they chose upon themselves or names that, that were given to them by French settlers and, and, and British settlers, you know. So, you know, just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, this is the book, this is the book cover, the Pop Away for the People. And she also did all the, um, uh, the drawing and illustration in this book. And it's just beautiful. I, it's one of my favorite parts of the books is actually the illustrations. Um, and you, I kind of get lost in all the little details and could you tell there was so much attention to detail and care put into, into this book. Um, this is when you open the book, this is the, the opening, um, you know, this is like in the inside cover, um, you know, I come a true daughter of the crane bringing this offering 
and I pledge my life and my sacred honor that whatever I learn of the blessed plan shall be used for the pupilling of the people. You know, that's basically a note she was taking and a promise she was taking um, when she was uh, taking upon the responsibility to, to learn these ways, um, you know, and that's her teacher there uh, handing her a uh, you know, medicine bag or, or a pouch. And this is actually an illustration at the end, at the very, at the back of the book in the back cover. And um, it's, it's, you know, it, it's basically um, a little bit of each of the stories that are told inside of the book. If you read the book and then you look at this page, you'll, you'll kind of understand, you know, so like, oh yeah, that's from that one story, that's from this and that. So it's it's a big you know it's a big hodgepodge and it's 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 a little trippy to say the least, but um I really appreciate it and I've you know like I said I've gone lost in this little piece here and and you know there's there's mushrooms holding Felenia signarius and and smoldering mushrooms and and there's uh, puffballs and there's a story of a snapping turtle and um, there's the crane it's, it seems like this tree is is. I don't know, hugging or strangling this person. Um, I don't remember that one. And this person seems to have, you know, different creatures, legs. And um, there's a lot of, like I said, there's a lot of folklore in this book. And, and some of them are kind of scary. Some of them are heavy. Some of them are funny. Um, you know, so, you know, I'm planning to share more. I did a book reading with, you know, with, with my community. And, and we did it over Zoom. And we're going to keep doing it. Um, so if you want to hear me read more from this book, um, you know, kind of stay tuned. Uh, this is one, another um, little drawing from the book, um, their garden or uh, the garlic whisks that she would make using um, mice. Can, who wants to say this word for me? Oops. But it's a uh, mycetes. I can't even look. Hold on. It's being covered. My Cetinus scorodonius. Um, it basically has a really garlicky smell, and then they would basically put them on sticks and then let them dry out. And they were used as like flavoring whisks. And you can, um, you know, when mixing or stirring a soup, it would flavor your soup um, with this garlic like taste. And so these is a, this is a depiction of them, you know, being, you know, dried out for use in, in cooking and drying out on the cabin wall. Are there any questions? Any questions come in? Yeah, we got a few now. Okay. Um, first one is from Ben, who is the PPMS president. He asks, okay. can you recommend any other books about indigenous use of fungi from other places or what books are you reading? Mm. Um, yeah, no, like I said, there's very few on indigenous fungi use. Um, right now, one of the books that I'm reading because I'm on Kumie territory, I'm, I've been trying to read uh, Kumie ethnobotany. Um, there's not much fungi, uh, uh, there's really not fun any fungi use mentioned in the book. Um, but, um, I th you know, that's what I'm reading right now. Um, I'm trying to get into that and, you know, educate myself on on the indigenous uh, names of the plants of the region that I'm living on. Um, um, I think, you know, that's, like I said before, it's uh, kind of a valuable thing to do. And it's, if it's, you know, you're interested in taxonomy, I think it's equally as interesting and, and valuable too. Um, but yeah, there's not many books. This is really one of the only ones. And um, you know, like I said, it's kind of a hard book and that's why I, I attempt to share it as much as I can because I feel it's my responsibility to share this book and make it accessible uh, to my community. So anybody knows when they come to my house, they can read it, but, and that's why I've been attempting to share it online as much as I can as well. Um, but yeah, that's really it right now as far as what I'm reading or what I can really recommend, I'm sorry. Like I said, that book by Kat Anderson is amazing um uh and that journal that she wrote on on indigenous fungi user california uh, uses um is really good and i do recommend that to anybody that's a fun read but her book tending the wild is great 
And of Thank course, you. really quick, I have to mention Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, which is like super near and dear to our hearts and my heart. Um, a lot of inspiration has come from from Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, Braiding Sweetgrass. So yeah, I mean, that's always a gem. If you haven't read that, you just need to add that to your repertoire. Thank you so much. I know that this book is like $300 online. <laughs> so it's really valuable um, to be sharing it like you are. Um, we also have someone asking about ways to send a donation to thank you for your work and time. And someone posted the, the POC Fungi Community Venmo. Oh, thanks, um, whoever did that. Uh, yeah, Mar GTS. Not sure who that is. Um, are there other ways to donate if someone like doesn't have Venmo? Um, so you know, I did you know because we're talking about the Uji, the Ojibwe and and the Anishinaabe. I did. I was trying to do a little bit of homework and and uh, you know wanted to uh, share that I, I did go to their website. The Ojibwe Cultural Foundation does take the donations. You know, just because I'm speaking about their ways and their people and their medicines, and um, you know, they're on Turtle Island, and and I wanted to, you know, share, you know, just share some resources to them, and and just well, like I said, to say thank you and 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 show my appreciation, and you know, try to honor their their ways and their culture, and then you know, this book, you know, that's what I'm trying to do. Um, uh, currently here on Kumia territory. Kumi Defense Against the Wall is, you know, they're collecting funds uh, for their efforts. Also, uh, Sexta, um, uh, you know, the CNI, the Congreso Nacional Indígena of, Me of Mexico is collecting funds. They're collecting $10,000 to help indigenous communities with uh, COVID relief. Um, and there's a link in my Instagram bio for that. You just go to my bio and there's a link to their GoFundMe page. And you can read all about that there and there's a YouTube uh, video there. Sorry about the dog. Um, um, and of course my, you know, our, we have POC Fungi Community is our Venmo. We also do, you know, PayPal and, and Cash App, but um, you know, anything that's, get, that's donated or redistributed to us, you know, it goes to, it goes to uh, medicine making um, and it goes, and we also, like I said, we engage in a lot of mutual aid. So it really does just get redistributed to, to different organizations and, and folks doing work. And, you know, we, we, we're all about uh, redistributing funds, uh, you know, wherever possible. So, um, so if you're not sure where to send money to um, and you trust us, you could always send it to me, like I said, directly uh, or to us, like I said, at POC Fungi Community at Venmo. But, but yeah, I appreciate that, whoever asked that. Amazing, thank you. And for the PayPal, is that um, is the email associated with that the POC fungi at community at gmail.com? You know what? No, and let, maybe let's not use that because that's I actually do it. That's my personal one, and I don't want to necessarily put on my personal Gmail or uh, Gmail account right now. Gotcha. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, 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 you're fine. I just kind of thought about that. I was like, oh, yeah, I don't have a one set up for, for that yet. Okay, well, we definitely have a lot of places to yeah. bring, give our money. So thank yeah. you. Yeah, thanks, and thanks everybody. Let's see. Okay, another question is, are there rituals associated with healing fungi? If so, can you give an example of how, how to do one and what it is for? Um, yeah, I guess answer that as, as you wish. Mm, yeah, so there there are healing rituals. Um, and what I would say is to learn any of those things, you need to uh, gain uh, relationships. You need to you need to build relationships with with one, you know, the, those people you wish to to learn those rituals from. Um, something that we, the POC fungi community, do is, you know, we we, we talk about these things. I'm so sorry about the dog. Um, 
Um, he's probably saving me. So, you know, what we try to do is 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 preserve this knowledge, and in doing so, we we talk about it, but we also we do it in a careful way because a lot of these rituals and a lot of these things are kept secret. We're kept secret for a reason, and like I said, there does there should be. Uh, uh, a way of building relationships first before going into any type of uh, ritual, and 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 you know, so actually that you know that question could be a little triggering to me just because, um, because I do see people trying to you know commodify not just you know the medicine but ritual use as well you know and 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 the songs that are associated with rituals and 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 the tools that are associated with those rituals. And you know you could go on eBay right now or, or Etsy and, and buy your own um, buy your own drum. Sorry, I have to do that. Um, you, know, you could buy your own drum, but um, you know I wouldn't say I would say that that's not that wasn't a well uh, earned drum. You know, so same thing uh, towards a ritual. I would say. If I just told you right now, um, it wouldn't be a well-earned ritual, or it wouldn't be it wouldn't be good for you, you know. Um, yeah, that's all I'll say about that. Thank you, and I'm sorry that was triggering. I honestly didn't finish reading that, and should have taken the time to. <clears throat> but you do bring up a a huge issue in. <clears throat> the appropriation aspect of, um, of fungi, uh, which is particularly, particularly I think prevalent um, at this time with uh, psilocybin containing mushrooms getting a lot of attention and even being decriminalized in some places and the implications of that. Um, yeah. Which, yeah, very much no. need to be addressed. And well, you know, I'll thank that person then for bringing it up because now I'm just gonna go off. <laughs> so basically, you know, to that I'll say is like, you know, you know, there's, you know, there's people fleeing, you know, um, for persecution or for whatever reason it may be from these countries where a lot of these rituals and, and, and like knowledge has come from. And so, you know, when, you, when I see people, like Paul Stamets, who has, you know, Mayan mushroom stones. And I wonder if they were given to him in a ceremonial way, if they're given to him by the Mayan people themselves. Um, and I, and I, and I'll say that, and I say that because I feel like if they were, we would have heard about that and he would have sold us. But, you know, I, I wonder where, if they were acquired off on the black market. And, you know, I'll speak, and I say that, you know, and, um, you know, I know it's, it's you know, people can get defensive or going to get a little uncomfortable because, you know, of who I'm talking about and who am I? And yeah, you're right. Um, you know, but if I don't speak up for those people who will, and nobody is right now, especially if you're trying to commodify that knowledge and that medicine. And like I said, people from those countries are, are fleeing persecution. Um, and, you know, there's a crisis happening at the border and, uh, you know, you know, we're willing to, that's to me, that's part of the exploitation or the, fetish, the fetishizing of our cultures. You know, you're willing to take rituals, cultures, songs, medicine, but not our struggle, not our, not our experiences, not the issues that are pertaining to uh, the people now that are existing and coming from those cultures and those people. So, you know, I, and I thank you, you know, I'm not trying to make that, you know, that person feel bad or anything, you know, but if they truly are, you know, learning, wanting to learn, um, and do things in a good way, in a ritual way, um, I would, you know, uh, urge to look at that first. And if it's something makes you feel uncomfortable that I said, and, you know, maybe look at that too, maybe, you know, ask yourself where, where that com uncomfort is coming from. Um, you know, anytime you do any type of medicine work, it's a difficult work. And for us, especially people of color, indigenous people, indigenous people and black people, when we do any type of medicine work, we, um, you know, it, it, it's, it could be traumatizing. It could and and, and re-traumatizing. It brings up um, 
ancestral memories. And, you know, so things aren't always cupcakes and rainbows and leprechauns and elves for us, you know. Um, so, you know, when we speak about these medicines, we speak about it, you know, and we, we do difficult work when we do and we work with these medicines, you know, and we're talking about sacred, sacred medicines, you know, so, um, so yeah, and that difficult work includes, you know, addressing the, all the intersections that we come with, all the, you know, you know, and then, you know, that includes uh, eco, eco justice and environmental justice and social justice and, and, you know, a right to our land and, and, and cross the borders without uh, persecution, period. <clears throat> Thank you so much for speaking on that. I'm not seeing any further questions at this time. So. Well, I'll, um, I'll try to end it on a little higher, more positive note. Um, again, thank you to that person. I don't want anybody to walk away feeling bad or anything, but um, like I said, they are important issues to me and to my community. And it is why we do what we do. Um, so, you know, in that, in that way, thank you for giving me the platform to express that. <clears throat> would you, um, is there anything else you would like to discuss or bring up or stories, one last story to tell? Yeah, let's, um, Let's talk about cooking puffballs. Has anybody eaten ever eaten a puffball? I harvested one today, and they're, del oh. they're delicious. I got some last year and year before as well. Oh, I did cool, find one cool. today. So good topic. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Then that's <laughs> that's why I landed on it. Okay. Perfect. There's a bunch of little stories in here, so I'm just I'm just like, which one calls to me? I'm trying to end it on a cool, cute note. So, uh, mino, mino, so, so I can quit. Um, this is the word for, for puffballs. Mino so quite, mino so so ikwe. And I apologize, and I'm trying to humble myself and, and attempt to say these us. words. Huh? Spell it for us. M I N O. M I N O. S O A. S O A. H N I. N I. K W E. K W E. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I typed it in the chat so that people can. Thank you. Yeah, please. You know, I'm trying to attempt to say these words, and I know, you know, I do it That's in a humble way. It's a mouthful. It's a mouthful. Thank you. <laughs> um, so please be sure that any size of puffball you use at any time is white, white all the way through. As puffballs become older, they also start to get bitter. And if they are yellow at all, this is a sign that they are in that condition. If you know the place where puffballs grow, live there several hours after a rain. Small puffballs can make luscious little morsels, but they can also cause one great big mistake, your last. Take with you into the field a sharp knife and a dry brush. And as you collect, brush off the puffballs. Also cut off any white uh, rootlets and dirt. Rootlets, it's 1971, remember y'all, this is basically mini mycelium. One sandy puffball in a basket may easily make the mistake of, oh my gosh, my dog. Your dog is telling the story with you. Yeah. We're gonna get to a more silent spot. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, y'all. You're fine. All right. Um, when, you get to them, when you get them home, when you get them home, never dump in a pan or water as you would straight down as you would potatoes. Just peel those that are peelable. Next, slice them straight down through the middle. Examine the two halves carefully, not casually. If there is anything inside at all, which looks even vaguely like outlines that might become a cap, a stem, as you value your life, throw that one away. Then wash your hands carefully and scald the knife and the cutting board thoroughly. The immature button of, of any of the nibo wash death-causing mushrooms can 
sometimes look much like a puffball, but the outside, uh, from the outside, if you have looked at the inside, it is not possible to have made a mistake for the interior of a puffball is plain, unre unrelived, opaque white, included in a stew like dumplings, little puffballs are winnie bogwad, possessed of excellence and taste. In the use of large puffballs, no mistake of any kind is possible for there is nothing in this world that looks like either the inside or the outside of the giant puffball. Slice up the puffball just as you would piece a piece of meat. Dip the slices into beaten egg, roll into a mixture of crumbs from hardened bread and oatmeal or crumbs from cornmeal and cracked crumbs, finely smashed nut meats and fry into a crisp on both sides. Now here's a secret of cooking puffballs at their very best. Do not add salt at all until after you have cooked them. If you add it before, the salt will destroy the special delicate taste that it that is theirs alone. If you are so fortunate as to have found a ready, a really giant puffball, share what you have left with a neighbor as it will not keep long. And when your neighbor finds something good, he will share it with you. I like the little story because at the end, it just like throws in a little bit of a mutual aid there, you know, which I, I really love. And um, yeah, so a little puffball story. Thank you. If you guys want, we can cut open this puff ball that I got today for a demonstration. Yes. <laughs> what a great way to end it. How perfect. We didn't even plan this, y'all. Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to start my video, and I'm not sure how I'm going to do this, but um, does everybody bear with me here? I'm going to stop the screen share. Okay. Okay, so let's... Hi, everybody. So here's... Let's see. Here's the here's the puff ball. I don't know how this is going to work. I have to balance it on the cutting board. Hold on. Bear with me. Okay, so here's the puff ball. It's just little. It's about the size of a baseball, small baseball, tiny yeah. baseball. Okay, so I don't know how can I'm, I can only cut it on the side. So I'm going to cut it without you seeing. I'm cutting it in half, just like the instructions said. And oh, this one is beautiful. This one is perfectly white on both sides. Nothing, not even a worm or a bug in, inside of it. It's beautiful, and it smells delightful. I'm sure it's going to taste delightful. So here is my puff ball I got today. And this came from Cheyenne Canyon. Just, I don't usually give my secrets away, but but I will today. So here we go. That. that looks so yummy. Uh, it smells amazing. So, Alyssa, I'm very jealous. <laughs> if it was any bigger, I would totally share it with you. And I have to brag, I got Aspen oysters from one of my girlfriends today. Whoa. She found a little, little elevation high up on the hill. Nice. I know. I'm super excited. So um, I, I guess that kind of concludes this meeting. I would like to say a couple of things, if that's yeah, okay. Um, well, first off, thank you so much, Mario. That was incredible. <laughs> um, and I also want to give a shout out to Olga Tsogas of Smugtown Mushrooms and the New Moon Mycology Summit. Uh, which takes place in the Adirondacks on Mohawk territory in New York State. Um, Mario and I connected in person almost a year ago at the summit. Um, beautiful, which, beautiful event. Truly, and Olga is largely responsible for organizing that um, with the Mycelium Underground Organization. So yeah. Yeah, must yeah. thank Olga for, for connecting us and connecting me with so many other amazing and inspiring people, um, especially, <laughs> uh, and it's just an especially uh, beautiful gathering because I've been to a number of different kinds of uh, mycology um, gatherings and they uh, can really uh, be quite homogenous in terms of uh, varying demographics like race and age um, and socioeconomic um, uh, positions. Um, and so the New Moon Mycology Summit is quite a bit more accessible um, 
in terms of the financials, it's on a sliding scale. You can also volunteer for free. Uh, also tickets include uh, a place to camp and, and food as well throughout the entirety of, of the three day weekend there. Um, it's not happening this year, but definitely tune in uh, if you ever want to veg venture there. Yes. Yeah, it's not happening this year. Um, I'm hearing I'm hearing things um, about next year, though. Um, I think y'all should stay tuned for an announcement like dates next year. But yeah, so many great people there, including Doa, Charlie, Nina, um, and you know, I've, I've met I met some of the most amazing people there, and um, yeah, beautiful time up in those sacred mountains for sure. So. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that. And yeah, Absolutely. glad to meet you there that day too. We had a good talk. Yeah. I also got this uh, Mycozine, the POC Fungi Community uh, fun, uh, Mycozine Volume 1, which is very special. Thank you for very saying nice. that. Yeah, we'll be doing a reprint soon of that. Amazing. Awesome. Let us know when that happens. We can post a link for people to get it. Yay, thank you. So thank you everybody who tuned in. Um, if you <clears throat> tuned in late or know somebody that might appreciate this, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and you can find tap this video here. anytime. Tap here. Tap here, tap here. Yeah, I'm not big, I, don't, I don't know how to do YouTube that good, but I Believe me, I just wanted to do that. I'm on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> You're live on YouTube. Yeah. So, yeah, subscribe to our channel. Um, please go to Instagram and, and follow Mario. And thank you all for your thank time. You. If you have any questions, you can you can send them to info at pikespeakmike.org and we'll get them answered for you. So signing Thanks off. Again, you know, it was an honor. Appreciate Thanks you. Thanks for coming, Mario. Thank we you. appreciate you very much. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Good night. Ciao.